I'm sure many of you have heard of the Nahani National Park, or at least the Nahani Valley. For those of you that don't know, this has been a place where many anomalous incidences have taken place. Prospectors show up without heads, cabins mysteriously burn up, people freeze in place in front of their campfires. It is a place full of anomalies, and if you visit there, there's a good chance that you will run across this phenomenon. Now the question is, where is the Nahani Wilderness? Well, the Nahani Wilderness is located deep within the Canadian Yukon in the Mackenzie Mountains. The Nahani National Park itself receives less than a thousand people a year. Why? Completely escapes me. Because this is clearly one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. If you went on a little trip there, maybe backpacking or fishing or whatever, there is very, very good chance you'd be able to stand in places no one else has ever stood. You'd be able to go to places no one else has ever been. You'd be able to see things no one else has ever seen. It's one of the last wildernesses on the planet. And believe me, I would love nothing more than to go there myself with a whole lot of mountain house and an AR-15 and spend a good chunk of time out in that beautiful, beautiful expanse. But let's go ahead and get into the history on why that might not be the best idea. The first victims of the Nahani Valley in the modern era were Frank and Willie McLeod, two brothers that, just like every other prospector in the day, wanted to make it big. And in the Yukon, there was definitely a lot of promise. A lot of people had made their fortunes in the Yukon Gold Rush, and they were looking to find their claim as well. They were lured into the Nahani Wilderness because of rumors of, obviously, a lot of gold. When they got there, they actually were able to recover quite a bit of gold. Allegedly, there was so much gold that their boat actually sunk, and unfortunately, all the gold did float away. However, they at least knew that there was gold to be had there, so they were turned back and informed their brother that they were going to be out there for a long time. I believe it was anywhere from six months to a year. The accounts differ. Anyway, the brother waited six months, didn't hear back. Waited a year, didn't hear back. Waited a year and a half, still didn't hear anything. And after two years had passed, he finally decided to get a search and rescue party together and go see what happened to his brothers. In his mind, they were just out there making it big, just put, piling up barrel after barrel of gold. That unfortunately is not at all what happened. And you see, as they were traveling down the Nahani River, they realized just how isolated an area this is. The Nahani Rivers and the mountain range is incredibly extreme. There are sheer cliffs on either side of the river, and in the side of those cliffs are caves, which to this day are completely unexplored. They are incredibly interesting to me. I would love nothing more than to get a drone and fly one in there and see what's going on. As he approached his brother's campsite, he came across the last thing he wanted to see. Two corpses were lying on the shoreline next to their camp. And worse yet, they were headless. Now, one of the corpses was also reaching for a rifle that was leaned up against a tree. The heads were never found. Now, what exactly happened to Frank and Willie McLeod? Well, according to the Canadian police, they died of natural causes, which, oh man, <laughs> what a horrible explanation. That doesn't make any sense for a lot of reasons. Let's say it was a grizzly bear. Well, as far as I understand, grizzly bears attack human beings for two reasons. One, if they feel threatened, or two, if they are hungry. In both cases, I'm sure the grizzly wouldn't mind actually eating what it killed. And why it ate just the heads? Well, that, that just simply doesn't make any sense. Obviously, the yum, yummy, tasty parts of the human being are the belly, the legs. The last part you'd want to eat is the head. So that just doesn't make any sense at all. The skeptic might put forth that it must have been Native Americans that killed the McLeod brothers. After all, even in the early 1900s, tensions were still very high and violence was not exactly uncommon. And although in many other cases this would have made sense, this actually doesn't line up here at all. You see, Native American tribes in the Yukon avoided the Nahani Valley. They believed it to be haunted, that it was full of giants and monsters and evil spirits, and they had no intention of ever going there. In fact, they had a legend of a Native American tribe that used to live there, called the Naha tribe. 
This is a very violent tribe that lived high up in the mountains and would very frequently come down from the mountains to kill and pillage all the other Native American tribes. Well, in the distant past, at some point, those tribes decided to band together to finally take out the Naha once and for all. Once the war party crested the hill, however, to see the Naha settlement, they realized it was completely empty and abandoned. There was no Naha to be found. There was no people to be found. There was no one at all. Although they saw this as maybe sort of a happy accident, they were still quite terrified that they had completely vanished without a trace. To this day, no one knows what happened to the Naha people. All these terrifying stories, however, did not stop Martin Jorgensen. This was another prospector who decided to venture into the Nahani wilderness nine years after the death of the McLeod brothers. Now, the details on his story are a little more foggy. It was a little harder to find source material. So please forgive me if I'm getting some of the details of the story incorrect, but I promise you the, the basis of the story is absolutely true. But what it seems like to me is that he heard all the legends of the gold that was in the Nahani region and completely ignored all the weird mythology behind it. It sounds like he got funding from business partners to go there himself and get a bunch of gold. So that is exactly what he did. We know for sure that he went into the Nahani wilderness and that he built a nice little one room cabin. He planned on staying there for a very long extended period of time. It sounds like anywhere between six months to a year and a half and he was expecting to get a lot of gold in the meantime. And gold he did get. Somehow, I'm not quite sure how, but he sent letters to his business partners letting him know that the gold was coming in just fine and that he was gonna meet them at their meeting spot in just a few short months and they were all gonna go get the gold and make off rich. However, when his business partners a few months later went to their meeting spot, Martin was nowhere to be seen. They waited a few days to see if maybe he was delayed or whatever. He never showed up. So they went out to his cabin and guess what they found? The cabin was burned, completely burned. It was ashes and on the ground. And Martin Jorgensen's corpse was inside the cabin and missing his head. There's a few details about this that are incredibly frightening. One is that the fire did not occur from the inside. At least that's not what it looked like. It looked like it occurred from the outside. Now, if Martin was inside sleeping, it's understandable that maybe he wouldn't be able to escape, but I don't know. To exist in the wilderness by yourself alone for months at a time, you can't really afford to be stupid. So, I don't know. I'm not saying it's impossible that he died due to the flame, but... How he didn't escape is a mystery to me. What it sounds more like is that his head was missing and then the house was lit on fire. So whatever came in and took his head probably lit the fire as well. Again, the Canadian police ruled that he died to natural causes, which again, <laughs> natural causes does not explain a missing head. Maybe it would explain missing legs, a missing torso, missing arms, missing eyes, but not a whole head. I'm sorry. That is not something that can just go away to natural causes and not affect the rest of the body. There are so many other weird things that have happened here that it probably deserves a second video. And that video will contain stuff that happened a lot more recently. There is one more thing, however, I want to go over with you real quick before we close this video out. This is by far the most under-discussed and weirdest part of the Nahani wilderness. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. In the very end of the chapter, in verse 24, we read that God drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, depending on what esoteric traditions you follow, some people believe that the Garden of Eden was located somewhere in North America. I know that's crazy. Believe me, a whole video about how America is actually the old world is in the works, and we'll get into that later. But anyway, what that means is that God never took the tree of life away and it sounds like part of the garden is still here on Earth somewhere. Now, some people believe it's under the Earth, but it's reasonable to believe that it is still somewhere here on the surface. 
And the Canadian wilderness is as good a place in any to hide what's left of the Garden of Eden. We also know that God sent cherubim and gave them weapons described as flaming swords that turn every which way. So there are angelic beings guarding this place, and they are armed with top-of-the-line spiritual weaponry, at least if you believe in the Bible. So that's really interesting and all, but what does that have to do with the Nahani wilderness? Well, in the early 1800s, many prospectors came out of the Mackenzie Mountains, where the Nahani is located, describing a beautiful tropical paradise deep, deep within the mountains. It was kept warm all year because of bubbling hot springs. It was home to tropical flora and fauna, and the animals were described to be so fat that they looked square. I think I've seen some people in Texas like that. Anyway, it was a hunter's paradise. It was absolutely beautiful. And it sounds like a very nice place to live. Now, here's what's interesting. If the Garden of Eden is still on Earth somewhere, and if the Tree of Life is still on Earth somewhere, the cherubim have absolutely no intention of letting you see it. And it sounds like they're probably pretty willing to kill you, maybe even chop off your head if you're getting close to its location. I'm not saying that the Garden of Eden is in the Nahani Wilderness. But I'm saying if I died and an angel told me in the next life that, yeah, that's where the Garden of Eden is, I wouldn't be that surprised considering what we've talked about today. Anyway, guys, the Nahani Valley deserves a second video. If you'd like to see that video, please leave a like and please comment on your thoughts on what we discussed today. And also, if you are excited for the upcoming content about all the great topics we covered today and talking more about the Nahani Wilderness, please subscribe. I would love to see you guys in the next video. If you guys are interested in supporting the channel monetarily, I've designed some really great stickers and the link to buy those is going to be in the description below. I, I hate it when people just straight up donate and don't get anything in return. So I'd rather you guys, if you want to support me, please go ahead and buy a sticker. The store will be in the description below. The store is called Civilian Expedition Outfitters. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I really look forward to talking to you guys again in the next one. Take it easy. Bye-bye.